we can have a long one. So happy to see you all here. Um, I just want to say a couple words as we begin this afternoon session, and I will just repeat what a couple people said, what a punctual conference it's been, and I will not <laughs> comment on the irony of that, <laughs> um, but um, I think it's because everyone is very respectful and loving toward one another, mm -hmm. and everybody really appreciates the time and thoughtfulness that's been brought together. That seems like a really good thing. Um, I, I had given a lot of thanks yesterday, and I want to apologize for forgetting to thank Maria Tuya and also Dane Lewis. Maria is not physically in this room, but she's been virtually in this room all the time managing the Zoom. And I'm so grateful to her for all the work she's been putting in. She's been a very good friend and colleague and partner um, uh, in a many different ways over time, including the collaborations with multi Delaware Nation members. So I want to express gratitude to Maria and also to Dane Lewis, who this morning was um, supporting us today and yesterday over at IAS. Um, I'm really happy to all be in this room together Remembering last year when Ian, um, and Mark Peters, um, um, uh, Mark's daughter and myself were here physically, others were joining virtually. And I know how much he would really love to be part of the conversation we're gonna be having here today um, uh, as a historian and um, someone who was working on the past, both for a love of the past and for what it could do for the people now. And so I just keep thinking about that. And the other thing I was thinking about is Lenape students at Princeton. And I'm not talking about the recent past, I'm talking about the 18th century, and I want to remember them. Uh, there's Jacob Woolley, Bartholomew Calvin, his younger brother, Nathan, who was a student in one of the schools in town, but was here at the same time as his brother, and George Morgan White Eyes. I won't take the time to tell their stories, though I've been thinking about them and, 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 and really eager to find opportunities to talk about them together. But uh, these, these students were here on the land we're on and with good experiences and bad. And it would be great to find ways to honor their stories, their past and the extent to which they're still here with us. So I just wanted to, to, to share their names and to invite future opportunities to remember them and tell their stories together. And so I won't take any more time in the way of introductions, but just to mention my name, our speakers, and say a little bit about how the time today is gonna to be shaped. We're going to be taking the next hour uh, to share with their knowledge and um, to point ways to, toward future directions of working together. And then at about three, we'll break for visits to special collections. Because we have such a wonderful group, not just uh, Muncie Delaware Nation members, including Chief Thomas and everybody else from the nation, um, but also members from Wavian Town, from Stockbridge, and other nations, right? So there's um, an extraordinary gathering of people here means we have to do it in teams. So one half will go downstairs to visit the objects. Uh, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll head over to special collections to visit the objects. And then the others will stay here in time to chat, have conversations, and then we'll swap. And then we'll begin again with remarks at 4.30. And Will Knoll, who's here representing the library, uh, will be giving some remarks. Ian will be giving some closing remarks. And Chief Thomas. Um, so that'll be a really good way to end the day. And so in just now session, we're going to have Melissa Morton and Caitlin Rizzo presenting together, and then Claire Garland together with Rick Gefkin and Faith Carlton, and then Anu Vedantam is going to present together with two Princeton University students, Evan Ditter and Cindy Boyangli. And every person will introduce themselves as we've been doing um, in the way that seems best to them. I'm Melissa Morton. I'm a research associate at the Institute for Advanced Study. And I work closely with Suzanne on mostly global history projects, actually, but this has been a wonderful um, other set of projects that uh, I've been able to be involved in and feel privileged to be working in collaboration with, with Muncie community members on helping to amplify and elevate their historical record and cultural history. My name is Caitlin Rizzo, and I am the archivist for the Institute for Advanced History. Oh, I'm the archivist <laughs> for the Institute for Advanced History. I'll use my outside voice today. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I have also been really, uh, really privileged to be working with, uh, working with Suzanne, but also working with uh, Mark Peters, who is no longer here, but who we'll talk about a little bit today, working with Melissa, um, and working with a lot of the folks, even in little ways, um, welcoming folks onto our campus and doing what we can to help and feel really, really lucky as someone 
who cares a lot about memory and memory work to be working with a community who cares so much about their memories and um, and feels them so deeply and is so connected to them. So thank you so much for allowing me to be in this space. Um, I really am just so happy to be among you guys. So Melissa and I are gonna be talking a little bit today about a project we worked on called the Muncie Names Project. Very smart. Yeah, yeah, very smart. And we thought it was really important to center Mark and Mark's voice, even though he can't be with us today. Um, and since I do want to read this quote, um, because it's Mark talking about his own work, he said, I don't think there's a job description for chief. I guess what it is, it's what you think is important for people and the larger public. I think really concentrating on these things that we're all moving toward, understanding our histories and reclaiming our culture and traditions and ceremonies. That's what I see as my job. Um, and I was so inspired by working with Mark with how much he knew about his history and what an amazing resource he is. Um, so much of the work that we're gonna talk about today began with Mark, comes from his own understanding of the value of his community, past, present, and most significantly, his vision for the community's future. Uh, we first got to meet with Mark in November of 2021. Um, and this quote is from around that time. Uh, we hope as much as possible today that we'll highlight his ideas and his thoughts because the importance of this work was always that it started with him and with his knowledge and that we understood ourselves to be supporting that knowledge. Um, and we really were hoping to center what he knew would be best for his community. So in our initial meeting, we talked about several ideas for projects that would support language and cultural revitalization among Mark's community. And we're just gonna kind of go through the projects that we discussed. Uh, the first one is the Muncie Main Project. And obviously we're gonna talk a little bit more about that one in particular. The second project we have written down is the Indian Agent Records Project. Um, and that aimed to analyze official records from the 1800s and 1900s related to diaspora and colonization of the Muncie community. The third project was the Simcoe Brandt Journals Project, which aimed to illuminate the contents of a journal created during a colonizer's visit to Muncie on the Thames community. Uh, the X Marks Project was connecting symbols on documents to Muncie names. Mm -hmm. So names in this document by a colonial settler. And you would see next to the symbol or sign X mark. So that's where, yeah. Um, the Muncie Language Collection Project with Princeton University, which we're going to hear about in just a minute. So we're going to kind of move through this so we can tell you more about that. And the Objects of Interest Project, which aimed to bring community members two cultural institutions that retain Muncie Delaware artifacts. And we heard a little bit about that throughout the morning session today about those experiences going into those cultural institutions. And I'll just say that this is from last year here in Special Collections. It's just a, walk, a short walk away from the room that we'll be going to when Ian McCown and, and Mark Peters were here visiting a lot of uh, objects related to language and um, that he, he was able to come to this place and be on the land and look at some of the objects related to the historical records. And also just to say, this is sort of was Mark's, I don't know, I don't know we call it his wish list, but it was like the things that had percolated up over the years that, you know, maybe he kept in a file in his brain or maybe a file in his office or something, but in conversations with him over over different meetings, it was like, what what do you want to do? Like, we will do, we we can read documents, we can grow all of our skills with this. Just tell us what what you feel is most important, and which you know, and and here's ideas we have about like this or this or this. But it will always be driven by the community and what he saw as priority. And so the reason why the Monkey Names Project rose to the top is because we really realized very quickly, like this is the groundwork that we would need to do a lot of these projects mm -hmm. uh, to be able to start with the 1829-1830 census and get those names down and transcribe and then start building from that. Um, many of the projects uh, would be contingent on 
well, having a, a, a base of knowledge about people and their names and uh, ability to, to go from there, so. Okay, so Mark's idea for the Muncie Name Project began with a document which Mark had seen a long time before we had our first discussion. Um, and this is that document. It's an 1829-1830 census, um, which listed the names of the Muncie community members living in Sarnak Village. You can see all this. Yeah. And you can see this. It, it gives um, household uh, the number of each person of each family in the household. It's like number of children, yeah. heads of family. Um, so Mark initially hoped to rediscover the document he had once seen and transcribe the names of early community members as a way to begin to reclaim the earliest record recorded histories of the community. However, we initially faced a major problem. We tried to find the census and I am a trained archivist <laughs> and it was extraordinarily challenging. We knew that the document originated with the Canadian government. And yet navigating the library and archives of Canada's website to find the materials was not possible. <laughs> um, at that point, I reached out to other trained archivists and archivists that worked at the library and archives of Canada to ask for favors as one archivist to the next. I'm looking at Faith, who's also an archivist, probably knows that, that trick well. Um, and we were given several guides to the record groups pertaining to First Nations peoples, but all of them did not contain the census. <laughs> and uh, that still didn't really help us. I mean, some of those guides are 300 pages long. And even as an archivist, navigating their finding aid structure was extraordinarily difficult. So after months and months of reaching out to institutional archivists, trying to look through the records ourselves, um, and making phone calls to regional archives, we thought, well, maybe if the, the National Archives doesn't have it, the local regional archive will be able to direct us. Um, we got lucky because Mark rediscovered a copy of the document. <laughs> um, so this is- We actually, found it in the archive, in Mark's archive. <laughs> Mark's archive, exactly. Um, so but it does point out this, the challenges, right? Of if, if, if we are trained to do this as professionals and we can't even find it, how are community members going to navigate those systems? It's, it's an it's a, it's a access to resources issue that's really almost insurmountable for most people. So, and it takes time. And I will pull back behind the curtain a little bit as an archivist. Um, one of the things that we're taught to do as archivists is if we see copies of something we know exists in a federal institution, we're supposed to throw that away because it's collected by another institution. It's called duplication and it's part of the routine work that we do is to throw things like that away. Um, this was an extraordinarily powerful reminder to me as an archivist about why received wisdom from the profession just further erases indigenous people, right? Um, that, that these, examples of Mark's collection being so much more useful because it aggregated those important uh, works together. I think it kind of goes back to the conversation we had about kites. Molly Miller asked about kites and ceremonies earlier this morning, um, why it's so important for those, those materials to be in the community's hands, right? Because the community are the people that can take best care of them. After we recovered the, the census, Melissa began the work of transcribing that census by hand. She compiled individual names, the listed tribal affiliations that were on the census, and the number of individuals um, in each household with the understanding that the names of individual peoples would provide a foundation for historical research, as well as contribute to ongoing efforts to reclaim traditional names for naming ceremonies. But after the first effort, Mark realized that we could do more. Mark offered other resources, which would be added to compile a broader list of traditional names gathered from archival sources. Um, and one of the books we have today, so this is a book that is probably familiar by Greg Curnow, um, but the books were particularly I'll challenging. Pass it around. Yeah. It's, so, and it's by an artist. So this person purchased some land that was originally Muncie land and then realized, oh my gosh, I'm living on indigenous land and really started to dig into the histories and it became part of his artwork and he became an archivist really of this, of this land that he was on and compiled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names relating to 
that land. So it was another thing Mark kind of was like, oh, I've got this <laughs> book on my, you know, an old photocopy, or he had an original book and someone, someone stole it. Someone someone stole stole it. it he said, and it uh, never made it, its way back. And we had a really hard time finding it. I mean, even here at Princeton University, Suzanne had to order that through interlibrary loan and I had to do the same. So it's- about the one you made? Yes, and I am I'm, I'm actually, a, in former life, was a book binder. And um, so I thought, you know what? I can make some copies of this. So, so close your ears, all librarians. <laughs> So I made a bunch of photocopies, high quality, and found them in case bind, cloth bindings, and, and was able to deliver that. And Suzanne and I took a little trip up to Muncie to, I uh, left it at Karen Moscow's house, but because uh, Mark was a kid's boy, but in the hospital. And um, uh, so he did get to, to see it. Hopefully he, hopefully he, got it. he, had, he had it in his. Hopefully it will be in his, his library or archive, wherever that ends up. So. so the books, because they were so much longer, we didn't want poor Melissa to transcribe a whole book. So Melissa reached out um, and asked if I could write a script, basically to take scans of the book and turn them into a spreadsheet. Um, and we wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. There was certain pieces of information that were really useful. So it would give you the archival citation. So you could go back and see the original document where that person first appeared. It would also allow us to kind of search the names and see where there were connections. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and so fortunately that process was pretty easy. Um, Melissa would scan the books. We would use Adobe to just do an OC, a basic OCR or opti optimal character recognition is what that basically Caitlin's like I'll just write like a simple python script and I'm like you go do that because I have no idea what you just said <laughs> as long as you give me a spreadsheet full of all this stuff so so I will say that Melissa is being very gracious because what a python script can do is turn it into a very messy data set and then Melissa helped me with the hard work of actually going back paying attention to detail making sure everything is correct and that that information is in a presentable format because we didn't want to give Chief Mark or I'm sorry we didn't want to give Mark anything that was um that was less than useful like we wanted it to be perfect for him you always have to clean it up but this is the other book that was we use as a reference is this Bob Grummet's uh Humsey um Indian book so yes from this which the book that this is the book that's being passed around at these nations book. Um, again, I just took I made a PDF of all the pages and then gave them to Caitlin and she put them through a program that can do optical character recognition OCR and turned it into words and then that got put into spreadsheets that got sorted and cleaned. So any little it's kind of old, it's 90s typography. So any little doodads or anything like that sometimes comes up as a weird character. And so you do have to go through and read everything, but at least it's now in a searchable um, data set. So, so that's like, this is what the page looks like. Yeah. And, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's also, um, one of the, the really great things about Kerno is that there yeah, are the buildings. Yeah, exactly. And and that was really challenging for scripting purposes. Um, and it is something we lost. And I think when you go to the spreadsheet, right, you can't see exactly this. So we wanted to make sure it was clear where the source, where it came from. So if you wanted to get that information, you could go back. But we did end up having to do a long review process. Um, and we realized during the review process the difficulties of using resources created by non-Indigenous authors in an Indigenous-led project. Um, we found inconsistencies in how communities were described, and we faced challenges reconciling non-Indigenous classifications as part of a project for the Menti people. A major question began to emerge, which is how do we imagine the usefulness of materials like Kerno's book um, and repurpose them for the needs that we had working with Mark. Um, and now that we've provided a bit of context about the project, it seems appropriate to look more carefully at the results. Um, can you click on that? Yeah. 
Did you pull or is that? Okay, it's okay. Um, so the final data set contained the names, affiliated dates, nations, and locations, as well as archival citations for nearly 900 historic indigenous peoples affiliated with the Muncie diaspora in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, you can use this to search, you can keyword search this data set, um, you can filter the content so you could look for specific individuals or, or place names. Or place yeah. names. Um, or the wonderful thing about the Kerno book is it has variations on the names. So we know that sometimes um, Indigenous peoples would use different names in different contexts. So you can do that as well. Um, for those people that we have that information for. Um, and there's also a link back to the original source document. So if there is some, some things that we've missed in translating it to a spreadsheet, we at least have a link to get back. And anyone's welcome, just email us to get this because this is not our... Yeah, yeah, by all means. Is, anyone can read this. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit now about the limitations and challenges. And this is me being an archivist. I use this mm -hmm. quote that I really love um, from a group of archivists that works with data. They talk about the necessity of refusing to understand data as disembodied and dehumanized and de-particularized, which just means it's not just uh, rows on a spreadsheet. And they talk about committing to understanding data as attached to bodies, that these are people that were alive and that we need to respect um, that, that these people were alive and that we need to treat them the way we would if they were living in right in front of us. Yeah, so the next steps, you know, uh, one thing Mark was thinking of doing micro histories, some of the individuals that came up. And so John Snake is a name, Nancy and Cornelius Westbrook, Jem and John Snake. And the, the snake name will be familiar to people in this room, but um, and working more completely on the census. So the, the people on the census are the groundwork, and he was always trying to move back in time. So mm -hmm. this is the, the latest sweet thing that he could start moving back from. But um, so yeah, it's trying to again build build the stories around these names <laughs> that are now uh, have come up. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor to be included in the symposium. Thank you so much. I'm Claire Garland. I'm the director of the Sandra Indian Historical Association in Monmouth County, New Jersey. I also serve as a historian and resource person for the American Indian Affairs Commission, New Jersey, and the New Jersey Historical Commission uh, Indigenous Education Project, which we're trying to put together a report now for the state of New Jersey by March. Um, <clears throat> and I brought a couple of things to show you. One thing is um, this map, I had it included in the first um, slides that we put together and somehow left it out of the second, but this is a, uh, an, the area of, you have to take the lines away, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, <clears throat> drop the lines and just imagine land and the Lenape speaking areas of uh, lower part of New Jersey into Pennsylvania, the middle part, and the northern part stretching all the way up to Connecticut. So <clears throat> I'll pass it on. Sorry about that. I wanted to start with the word Shahabi, which I discovered recently uh, in a New Jersey historical booklet that I ran into in the library. When you're looking for something else, you find something you're not even looking for. <laughs> Apparently, this was what the native people called New Jersey, according to this um, speaker at the time. Words around us. Um, <clears throat> these words are all over our New Jersey maps. And they're still there because they were written in deeds. And so you can find Minasink, Wicketunk, Navasink, Raritan, Rollway, Papacon, Passaic, Parsippany, mm -hmm. Cheesequake, 
Matawan, Muscon, Metcon, and these were all identified as paths, Indian paths. Now, some of them we know as rivers, towns, streams, places, areas, but they started out originally uh, used by the Lenape people of the area. Yeah. Other places around us, Hakoxen, Manasquan, Matawan, Nigahomi, Portapec, Wampum, Brook, which is near me in Eaton Town, um, <clears throat> Crosswicks, Squonkum, Matitacon, Rumson, Rockaway, Ramapo, Rancocas, Barnegat, Cinnaminson, Hoboken, Mawa, and Manahawk. Now, some of these have had things attached to them, syllables in front of them, syllables in the back of them, um, but over time, they became anglicized and English sized, if there's the word. And they just shortened them to the point where they knew where it was. And written in deeds, Molica, Matuchin, Medcom, Paramus, Pika, where Jackie Lamassus kept her horses, Pomona, Piscataway, Runamine, Suspasana, Tappan, Totowa, Tina, Connecticut. Lackawanna, still there and from the original language. And Minnesota, Idaho, Illinois, without the O usually, uh, Missouri, Kansas, Alabama, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Utah, Arizona, Wichita. Names of the nations who lived there became the states that we call our states today. Topeka, Chattanooga, Yosemite, Tacoma, Memphis, Canada, lots of names spelled with a K. And of course, the English changed it to C to be different, Canada. Uh, Tallahassee, Tampa, Miami, Bahama, Nantucket, Dakota. So words that we think are American are Lenape. Chiefs, Seattle, Pontiac, Cadillac, who was also a French governor sent to New France, but there are two Cadillacs, one recorded by Jesuit missionaries, and then another one that came later. Wanamasa, which is near uh, where I live in Asbury Park. Croton, Gowanus. You might have heard of the Gowanus Canal in New York. Oregon, Yucatan, Milwaukee, Mississippi, Ohio, Arkansas, Massachusetts, Buffalo, Tuckahoe, Secaucus, Thompson, Tahawali, Mishani, Manilokan, Merrick, and Ron, Ron Concomo. I think what got me interested in this was the four years I spent working in the New Jersey Bell Telephone Company mm -hmm. as an operator when I was in high school. <laughs> Back in those days, you would put money in a phone <laughs> and then dime to get the operator to connect you to Ron Concomo <laughs> or Mamaronek or some of these strange places. And I'm like, where is that? <laughs> so I got hooked. Navison. Um, according to this New Jersey Historical Society bulletin I ran into a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nawa meant point or angle or corner. So they think that the words that started with Nawa meant like a peninsula or something that juts out. Um, now to think other variations of spelling that you come out to in different writings through the centuries. I uh, just wrote them out for you. Nara sons, never sinks. Noah sons, ne Nuwa says. Nova sons, no home son. Now see, in our area, <clears throat> it was settled by the Dutch first in the 1620s, 30s, 40s, 50s. <laughs> so the Dutch had a very prominent uh, presence in our area of Monmouth County, right across from New York. Uh, then the English took over and rearranged everything, put everything in the way they wanted to say it, used the phonetic spellings and all that they wanted. Um, <clears throat> but it was recorded that the settlers arrived in Navasink on December 7th of 1663, and that was in the Albany Record, volume 21, page 401. 
Now, according to the mayor of Middletown, the town that I live in, uh, they have the date of 1662 as the settlement. So they don't know quite if they came in 62 and went back and then signed the papers by then it was later, but anyhow, somewhere around that time. Other regional names, Canarsie, Montauk, Mamaroneck, Tammany, Sing Sing, the Sagaponic, we call Sag, Harbor, Hackensacky, Hackensacky was how you'll see it in, in old writings, i.e. was dropped off, Nyack, and of course mountains, Appalachian, Adirondack, Taconic, Allegheny, Kittatinny, Pocono, Shenandoah, Wachon, and the language groups of that area on the map that I got going around. The Mincy, um, groups that were in that area, and I'm not going to try to pronounce them all, but you can see the Wawa, Wawa um, beginning on a number of them. The Yanami, meant people down the river, and you see the Navasinks are included in that area, and even Mancocas, and the Unilatico. Um, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but you can see the Absecan, the word Absecan probably comes from that group right there. Um, okay. Um, Okay, I wanted to um, introduce you to my friend Rick, who's going to complete this. And um, <clears throat> Rick and I met um, um, on a project um, speaking at Red Bank Library years ago. We've been friends ever since. Uh, he's the author of several books, including Hidden History of New Jersey. Um, he's a he was able to interpret the English language that we would find on deeds and also um, use an overlay to put those places and streams and rivers on current day maps to see exactly when, where that deed um, fit. And of course, if you see the language in these deeds and you can barely read it, it's like 400 year old um, so-called English. You can get a word every now and then, but um, <clears throat> it's a definite skill. And uh, right now, Rick is working on a database of deeds, um, listing the native signatures and the payments and other information, just as Melissa and, and Pedro are doing. So, Rick, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, <clears throat> and before I forget, I wanted to bring this for you to see. This is called Owning New Jersey. And it really gives an extensive uh, background of the area, the land that we call New Jersey. I mean, from the very, very beginning, and even then some, plus <clears throat> a lot of the records and deeds and um, <clears throat> areas that were um, just under, con under um, different control and, and all of that. Some of our family is listed in here also. And this one is a new book that just came out. And I think it would be really worthwhile for you to take a look at it because it, it's written by a Finnish guy from Finland, but it's from the native perspective of how you see history, how you see what happened here. And it really covers, um, you know, pretty much North America, the Spanish, the French, the English, the Dutch, everybody. So uh, treat yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. So I'm Rick Efkin, as, as uh, Claire mentioned, and uh, I've been puttering around Monmouth County for most of my life. And uh, when I retired from something called work, I decided <laughs> to get interested in my local history. So mm -hmm. one thing, as you all know, leads to another. Um, and this is not quite in focus, but it's part of the deed that, that they showed before. And, and I think uh, Faith is going to talk about too. But if I can, indulge me for a second. I want to give you a little background because my area of our state, kind of due east of where we are today, is really, really historic in terms of obviously a Lenape homeland, but also when the cross-cultural um, uh, contingents met, if you will. So 1609, we know Henry Hudson came uh, up the coast on one of his voyages, 
We know that he stopped in what is now Atlantic Highlands Harbor. We know that Lenape people came on board, and at least at the beginning, they all were long very friendly. When I was a kid, I used to go to what has always come down at Henry Huston Springs, which allegedly is where Henry Huston was directed by the Lenape's to fill up his water casks. Mm -hmm. So based on that 1609 and a couple of other journeys Hudson made, the Dutch claimed this whole territory. Fast forward, 1640s, a group of religious dissenters from Massachusetts Bay came down to New Amsterdam, talked to Willem Keith, who was the governor, and asked him if they could live there. And he said, sure go out to Long Island. And his real intention was to make them a buffer between the Canarsies and himself and the rest of the Dutch settling in New York, one of his motivations. Fast forward again, 1663 has been alluded to already, a group of these people who had settled in what is now Gravesend, Brooklyn still, came down, attempted to purchase against the Dutch, the Dutch uh, orders land from the Lenape's and then in 1664, when the English came in and took over and changed everything, as Claire said, um, English folks started to buy, in quotes, property from the Lenapes. Okay, that's because Richard Nichols, the governor, the English governor, said you must contract with the Indians first, and then we'll give you land grants. Okay, so that's kind of the preamble. This deed um is here in the library i think we're going to see it today i hope right mm -hmm. um and it's very very important to all of our histories for a couple of reasons so it dates to that year so it's roughly nine or ten years after um what was what was called the monmouth patent one of these huge land grants duke of york richard nichols to the end of settlers um and in this deed when you get into it you can't see it there of course we've got the names you saw them before a little bit of some Lenape sagums, okay? Um, and also the English folks. And when you get into the actual deed and look at it, there are a multitude of place names, which are important for a lot of reasons. Um, and just to give you an idea, and if I can, I don't know why that came up, but this is the land that is described in that deed. Now, it was printed upside down, so some of the old script uh, looks that way. So I corrected it for north. Way out here off the map would be the ocean, and this is Monmouth County. This is now Tinton Falls. This is the Navasink, right, in the deed, the Neversink River. And then other portions of the deed talk about things that we can identify today. And I won't try to pronounce all of these, but the first creek that, that is described is there, et cetera, et cetera, all the way around until you get to this. And I'm hoping somebody here can kind of Take that name, which is the name that the Lenape called Tinton Falls. Does that look familiar to anybody? Warm among them? Any any part of that? Okay. Yes. Well, not in Lenape, but in Algonquin, Woody means good. I don't know if that helps. Might, might. Okay. But again, the importance of this is that we have names from 1674 that we can identify. By the way, this name down here, Hakaxo, we still have that right there in our geography. We call it Hakaxo. So it hasn't changed very much. So this is, among other Ds, a really, really vital source of information that I hope will do a couple of things. In some of these early deeds, we have a, a man na named and he says, my brother. Now, I don't know if that's his actual brother, Okay, but it might be. So I'm thinking that if we can accumulate enough material, we can establish possibly some genealogies as well to bring forward and then maybe connect it, with, which is what happened uh, with, uh, with what happened in Canada years later. Okay, the reason this particular deed I use for an illustration is it's very, very important for a lot of reasons. The obvious one is it contains Lenape personal and place names in at least what the English heard, okay? It's also got some Dutch and clearly English names as well. And then this particular deed, and right here at the Tinton Falls, an actual waterfall, is where a couple of years later, Lewis Morris, who's incredibly instrumental in our history in New Jersey, first brought up Barbadian slaves to work this whole geography, but particularly his iron and then grain mines, uh, grain uh, mills. So there's a lot going on here just in this one deed. So that's one deed. 
So that led me to think about what about other deeds? This is an eye chart. There are hundreds of deeds in what are called the colonial conveyances, mm -hmm. early English records, okay, <laughs> a lot of which were lost in the revolution, but there's listings. I have them there online. I can give them to anybody who wants them. And what I did was, and they always start here, Indians, to whoever the English settlers are, and then the geography. This is just a listing. I underlined for my own selfish reasons, Monmouth County deeds that I want to begin to explore. But if I blow up one here, every once in a while, they will point to a deed with two Lenape names, okay? Who it got sold to. And then if I drill down into that deed, which I won't do now, I can probably figure out where that was, not too far from here on the Raritan River. And then we can maybe, maybe probably definitely plot that land and any place names that are mentioned, we can show where they are today. So I think that these hundreds of records, there's page after page of these that are ascribed as Indian deeds can contain a wealth of information, genealogically, historically, culturally, uh, it goes on and on and on. And I think uh, as I create, I'm gonna start with a, a simple Excel spreadsheet and, and maybe we can expand that to a database that can link up with what I just heard about the, the Muncie records. And we may even get lucky and find names that overlap. Because these deeds go not only just from the beginning of contact, but through almost into the 1800s. So again, a wealth of information there that um, that we can discover. So I think that's me. Thank you. Well, I'm Faith Charlton. I'm the lead processing archivist for Manuscripts Divisions uh, at Princeton University Library. Um, and I just want to say that I very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in this session. Um, I am a white cis woman and by no means an expert in Indigenous studies or in working with Indigenous related archival collections. Um, and I also just quickly want to thank my co workers, Kelly Golding and Valencia Johnson, for some of the slides that I'm sharing. Um, and so just kind of going off on what Claire and Rick were saying, I'm going to be talking also about this uh, 1674 deed related to Tinton Falls, uh, the Tinton Falls area, um, and due to conversations that occurred at last year's symposium about this particular item, Princeton Special Collections Indigenous Collections Working Group decided to focus some of our initial reparative redescription efforts on Lenape related land deeds. Um, and this is found in our miscellaneous manuscripts collection. Um, so just for some context about the library's work in this area of redescription, the Indigenous Collections Working Group uh, is a small group that includes archivists and a curator we formed last year to focus on Indigenous related archival collections and rare book materials at Princeton. Um, this group is actually an offshoot of Special Collections Inclusive Description Working Group which is made up of archivists from the archival description and processing team, whose goal is to describe archival materials in a manner that is respectful to the individuals and communities who create, use, and are represented in our collections. Um, last year, the library administration also formed a library-wide inclusive and reparative metadata working group. Um, they're currently focused on subject headings and we work in parallel with them. Uh, while the goals of the Inclusive Description Working Group mm -hmm. represent what archival description should always be doing mm -hmm. as part of its core functions, the need for a focused effort stems from the fact that our predominantly white field has not always described people respectfully or accurately, particularly when we're described when we've described people from marginalized or minoritized communities. We use a reparative framework in order to address these past failures, meaning that we are actively prioritizing collections, people, and subject areas where, where there's been the most harm done and directing our limited labor and resources there. Um, we also seek to prioritize mutually beneficial collaborations with communities represented in our collections. Um, rather than, as Colette was talking about earlier today, just extracting resources and knowledge from them. Um, and we approach our work from a position of cultural humility, which as archivist Jessica Tai explains, emphasizes co-learning through community engagement, collaboration, and partnerships. Um, it normalizes not knowing. 
Um, and just really quickly, this quote from Toni Morrison makes the challenge of this work very clear. How are we limiting the knowledge that our users can glean from our collections with the language we use to describe and contextualize them? And what can we do to address this? So with the Tin Falls related deed, Kelly Boulding and I began by drafting a revised description of the item using a very helpful transcription that Suzanne had authored. Um, determined not to work in isolation and instead in partnership with experts in this area. Um, Anu had put us in touch with Suzanne, who also put us in touch with Melissa and Claire and Rick, who all kindly agreed to review our draft. Um, and with their combined expertise, they provided us with very helpful feedback that we incorporated into the item's description. So on the left, you can see the old um, kind of scant description um, that was in our finding aid, basically the descriptive record that described this item. Okay, so this is the revised description. Um, and as, as you can see, we updated the title. Um, for the revision, Kelly and I focused on naming, acting on the premise that describing a person by name is an act of affirming humanity. To describe discoverability and access to people, particularly those from Lenape communities, we describe the subjects of the documents in addition to describing its creator, which since this is an official document, we assigned to the province of New Jersey. Uh, we also included descriptions in the title. Uh, sorry, I'm scrolling around a bit. And in the scope and contents or the description of the item, um, we included current and former place names, um, multiple dates associated with the item, including the date of creation and the date of record. Um, just to note that there's a little technical glitch on the website, so only the date of creation is showing right now, but hopefully that is resolved soon. Um, the description offers some context of the item, including, again, names of people, communities, and lands represented. We also included information about where this item came from, who donated it, and when. Um, also information about how this item was processed and described um, here. We also included multiple subject headings uh, for additional discovery and access. Um, so names, places, topics, uh, including local headings that are not um, currently included in the Library of Congress, such as Navisank and Sand Hill, um, Indians who are represented in this deed. Um, and just wanted to point out, description work, like all archival work, is iterative. So we may end up revising the description again in the future if more information becomes available. Um, descriptions are in no way final or static. Um, so just to wrap up really quickly, since updating the description of this item, Kelly and I have participated in conversations with all of the folks I mentioned who we've been working with about next steps, including the library providing a space on one of its platforms, for example, its website or its digital collection site for community members and other experts to share their knowledge and providing additional context about land deeds and other special collections materials related to indigenous studies. Um, we also plan to continue redescribing other Lenape related um, and area land deeds found in Princeton's collections. And most important, we want to continue to develop mutually beneficial relationships with the communities represented in our collections and prioritize their needs. Um, so thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I plan to talk for about 10 minutes, and then I have two students who are going to say a few words. I'm hoping that we can also talk later in the afternoon if I um, go through things a little too quickly. Um, I wanted to start by saying, Anushik, I'm just really glad to be here and have a little bit of time to talk with you. Um, I'm going to put my um, slides in the chat. I hope, Stephanie, you might be able to do that. The link that is here on the title slide uh, we'll take you to some links that are um, to explore because there's quite a lot in our collections that I'm not going to be able to pull up on screen, but I'm hoping people can play with it um, on their own. So my name is Anu Vedantam. I'm our library's liaison for Indigenous Studies. Before I jump into my presentation, I wanted to say welcome to Firestone Library for everyone who's just here for the day. I hope you feel very welcome and I hope you take time to walk around and see other parts of it in addition to the parts you're going to be seeing in special collections. If you don't mind a few flights of stairs, the view from the top of the tower is definitely worth a visit. 
One floor below us are many of the books relating to Native American history. Rick and I just took a walk down there and looked at them. And then also one floor below us is the African American Studies Reading Room, which is worth a visit. And on the first floor, there's a new collection. I'll be showing a picture of that in just a second. So I'll start by just talking a little bit about myself, just because I think it helps to know where I'm coming from. So I am not an indigenous person. I'm a first generation immigrant from India. I came here when I was 12 years old, right to New Jersey. And I've actually lived all over New Jersey. So many of the names that Claire mentioned are very familiar to me. My own family is from the Southern part of India, but I actually grew up far away from where my family's from. So this feeling of being disconnected from land is actually very part of my own background. I grew up speaking several languages, but none of them very well. So that sense of like always not knowing the language I should know is also very much part of my background. So recently though, what I've been thinking about is the importance of libraries in helping keep languages alive. And I'm gonna show a couple of examples relating to indigenous languages in particular. I've also become a lot more ambitious lately about what libraries can do. So some of the comments that I heard this morning are really going to stay with me. So I'm gonna start by talking just a bit about our library. And you're gonna be visiting um, this exhibit later today when we do our reception, which is gonna be right near the front door, um, right at five o'clock. So we have a very extensive library. You're seeing quite a lot of it today, even in terms of the people you're meeting. Um, very large in terms of the number of books, so more than 15 million. Um, very deep, very broad in its collections. Also very complicated, which you know, it's, it's, it's its own animal. But our capacity to digitize materials is something I want to just bring to your attention. Share them online, um, including the deeds that we looked at. Um, and I think to engage in different ways, the types of projects we're taking on, I think are really changing over time. So I hope today is the beginning of some relationships that we will build with each other. This exhibit that's on the screen is titled Records of Resistance. And there's several indigenous voices that are in this exhibit. So please do take a look during the reception and engage with it. So how did we get involved with indigenous studies? Just a very quick history. In December 2020, we had the good news that Princeton was going to be taking on several faculty hires in Indigenous Studies. And that led our library to start thinking about how does the library support Indigenous Studies. And it was interesting. It started with a gift from a tech magnet from Google. It's interesting. Um, but as a result, our library started to think about the way we are organized. The way we're organized right now, we have over 50 liaison librarians who are really very extensive staff, but we're organized by academic departments. And ind Indigenous Studies doesn't fit into an, into an academic department. So we started thinking about our structure and the way in which we might work together across our units to be able to support interdisciplinary work. And the other thing we started talking about is how much library staff need to relearn history because we were not taught the history we needed in order to support Indigenous studies. And I'm going to share a couple of examples of how we've been educating ourselves. <clears throat> so we started with some conversations within our library where we invited all library staff to join. And what we realized is that we were unaware of our own biases. We were unaware of how little we knew, and we had to really take on some self-education. So we then moved from a single large conversation to many small group conversations so that we could hear more of the voices within our library and people could start to articulate things that made them uncomfortable, which is a big part of this work. This eventually led to a charge for something called the Indigenous Studies Working Group in March 2021, which was in the middle of the pandemic. Right. So over Zoom, we took on many serious topics and we actually engaged with many of the folks in the room. And I will share a couple of details about that in a second. We also start to look at what is in our collections. As um, we've been hearing, you're going to be engaging with our special collections in just a little bit. We learned that we have incredibly strong collections in many Indigenous languages, but the ways in which the collections came to us, there is a problematic history there. So thinking through how things got here was pretty important. And also thinking through how hard it is for us to find what's in our own collections was another set of um, 
processes. One thing we discovered is that the Library of Congress subject headings are really not helpful, right? There were more than 2,400 different subject headings that related just to Native Americans, just in this, this country, much less indigenous folks from all over the world. So we did quite a bit of analysis, quite a bit of programming to try to make it a little easier to find what's in our collection. I'm not gonna open up the links because I think that's just going to have technical issues, um, but I will share this presentation so that you can explore the collections in some depth. Within the library, we took on an indigenous studies reading group. This involved librarians reading the latest research by Princeton faculty and graduate students. I know Sarah Rivett is in the audience. She and Robbie Richardson and Izzy Lockhart came and presented to library staff so that we could understand what is the current thinking about these topics, because it's not something we have all studied formally. And so we read their writings. We talked about it over the course of several months. We met with graduate students to try to understand the ways in which they are looking for the library to support their work. And it was really the focus was on self-education, because we cannot do our job well if we don't even understand the topic that we're taking on. What did we do as results? The first thing we did is quite a bit of programming with our IT department, where we created a category called Indigenous Studies. When we started this work, there were only 8,000 items findable. Now there are almost 200,000. Mm -hmm. If you click on this link today, you will see there are 26 items that were added last week. So this is a good way to stay up to date with what the library is buying. Going back to the idea that there's 15 million items, right? Like, so the easier we make it for people to find things, the more likely it is that research will be properly supported. We also learned that a lot of our materials are mislabeled. Things are called by languages that they are not in. So you obviously won't find it if it's called something completely different. So being more aware of even minor errors and that has been one of the things that has been really fascinating to me. I'll talk more about that in just a bit. We've also talked about the importance of improving our workflow. So something like the land deed that Faith just discussed, can we make that easy to digitize so that people can get to it? And I'll share a couple of examples of recent digitization work in a bit. This is an example of a grant that's not related to um, our topic for this symposium, but I think is a model. This is a digital repatriation grant we are taking on uh, with materials from the Philippines. And the whole idea with the digital repatriation grant is that the high quality scans are made available in a way that community members can directly engage with the material. Mm -hmm. One of the software programs we're playing with is called From the Page, which allows crowdsourcing of transcription. So multiple people can read the item and comment on it um, from remote logics. So, mm -hmm talking a little fast, I'm trying to move quickly through the material. Now I want to talk to the talk about the kind of the crucial part of our time today. I've created a document and it's linked on the screen. I'm going to try to open it up. It contains the materials that directly relate to the Muncie Symposium. And it has ways in which we can engage with each of you, as well as other people that you might know, who might have knowledge to share to help us improve um, the work we are taking on. I'm going to go ahead and open this up. And let me see if I can make it a little easier to read. So I won't click into each link, but I'll just talk through what's here. So we started an important digitization project this year, thanks to Will Noel, who led the charge there. And all the items on this are now digitized. And there are seven items related to the Lenape language. So let me open just that section up. Each item that has been digitized is fully available online. And the next step is to take a look at it and describe it in those same ways that Faith has just described the land deed. So I'll just pull up a page so you can see how this looks once it's done. So this is a spelling book. And I think there's a... Um, a picture of it on my slides too. So there are 103 items that have been digitized within the last year that are available to the world. And what we're looking for now is better understanding of what is in these items now that they are digitized and available. 
we, I mentioned earlier that we have 15 million items in our catalog. We have only 40 items that are listed as being in the Delaware language. So what does that mean? That we have 15 million items and only 40 of them are in the language that is related to the land that the university is on. I think this is something for us to discuss. Of these 40 items, many are duplicates. So it's not even 40 different items. Um, we do not know which ones are Munsi, which ones are Unami. We do not know exactly what language these items are in. So that's a small part of the description that's ahead. Um, and only 40 of them. So the other part is to think about what are the things that need to be added. One interesting um, analysis we did very recently is of our children's books. So we actually have um, an incredible number of children's books in different indigenous languages. How do we share this information? How do we digitize some of these children's books and make them available? If they're in our, they're in our, in our collections. So I'm gonna stop there and just welcome you to play with this document, which we will make available through email um, and engage with us as we try to do better with the items that are in our care. So baby steps, we have just started a physical collection and Rick has been the first person to actually engage with the collection. It's on the first floor. It just has a label on it says indigenous studies. And on the right side is Marie Wonga Connolly, who has made it possible. We're going to be adding some more items to this, including a shelf that focuses on the Lenape language. And Evan and Cindy, I'm going to ask them to just speak briefly with us about their work. They have been engaging in some of the materials that have been recently digitized, as well as some of the materials. Evan is actually helping us figure out the physical objects that are going to go on these two shelves. So Evan and Cindy, would you please say a few words? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cindy. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. But when I was 15, um, I took a brave choice. I flew all the way across the world. I go to Sand Rock Reservation, North Dakota, and stayed there for a whole year. And when I was there, I learned some Lahuta, um, Lahuta Norse, which is the native language. I also interact with the first hand um, lot of documents, historical resources, um, as well as art which is my major focus. I study art history in Princeton. And I really wanted to focus my study on indigenous art history because I think this is an area that's mm -hmm. definitely understudied and has a lot to offer. I was able to join this project because I take a Native American literature class here with Professor Sarah Louette and Brandy, which is also a teaching assistant in our class and also my classmate um, is also here. And it's, it's a great community that has a lot of, you know, connections to authors. And um, I was working with Anu and Evan with um, the indigenous Lunate and Munsi um, book collections. I was writing descriptions for the seven objects. And um, if you guys can take a look, I have wrote like a document, which I think, I believe is in the Google Docs that Anu just shared. And feel free to comment on it and give any feedback. Yeah, that's about me. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Evan Bitter. I'm a graduate student here at Princeton in the Department of French and Italian. Um, um, and I'm currently writing a dissertation on representations of indigenous languages um, in 16th century French travel narratives. How does it influence the way that French authors are thinking about their own language in the 16th century? I'm also doing a fellowship at the library this um, semester, so I was very excited to get the opportunity to work on the various projects that are going on here. As somebody who's had experience sort of navigating the library's immense and really great collections, it can be very intimidating to sort of walk through the stacks or even search the catalog or the various other databases that a lot of these collections are stored on. And even as, as I was doing a part of my contribution for this project, kind of walking through the stacks and looking for books to recommend for the shelf upstairs, I was once again reminded of really how overwhelming it, it can be to sift through all of this wealth of information that we have here. So with that in mind, I think that in this new collection on, on the first floor, this curated collection will be a very useful thing, especially for students that are just starting to sort of ask research questions or don't know where to look yet to find the answers to the questions that they're asking. I think it's a really good opportunity to make those materials more accessible. But I also think that there's also a question of visibility. Um, the shelf is actually in a very, very good location. It's very visible on the first floor. So I think it's going to be a good thing. Visibility in a, in a literal sense, but also visibility in 
um, in the sense of one of these, uh, these sort of curated collections are a very good opportunity to sort of highlight materials that are authored by individuals that are from the communities that they're talking about, um, as well as highlight a greater variety of genres, so contemporary, um, contemporary studies, as well as historical studies and oral histories, as well as linguistic texts. So I think this will go a long way in, in terms of supporting Indigenous studies on campus. So I'm very excited to be in, uh, involved. Thank you. That was an awesome panel, thank you. And so much opportunity for following up on the hard and important questions that have been emerging in the sessions earlier today and yesterday. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Why don't we take 10 more minutes that, so we have a chance for a little bit of discussion and starting those conversations. So, and it comes to you have a question. Yeah, I was wondering how many to all the indigenous authors or influencers or any big statistics about the amount of have the amount of books that talk about the language, but I'd be interested to know uh, if there if there really the number is on the actual author being related. I think what we're learning is that the way in which we organize the information makes it hard to find that answer out. So if we know the name of an author then it's really easy for us to figure out the exact number of items from that person. But the difficulty is that the way, and that we actually were just talking about this is just, it's really hard with the multiple spellings of names, as well as the disaggregation by name can get really complicated. So two people might have the same name, one person might be an indigenous person, one person might not be. So this is issue of named authority becomes really complicated. It's something that librarians are good at, but in this area, we're not as good at it as we should be. Uh, I, I know that's not an answer to your question, but it's just a, a sense of why it's a hard question. Yeah. Would, Suzanne, would, please jump in if you have other oh, thoughts. No, no. I was just wondering, because I was thinking about how there's this emphasis about uh, trying to uncover history, and I think that it's we, as indigenous people, we write about things very differently in a certain context that reading something by a non-indigenous person. Uh, there's tons of microaggressions and also a, a disunderstanding of it. So I was just wondering how, though, if we do have folks by indigenous people, how are those being uplifted versus their uh, European or German counterparts? Yeah, that's a really it's an excellent question. Um, one thing I have done is created a libguide for Indigenous studies, where I'm uh, foregrounding books by Indigenous authors. Um, it's not it's not going to be a large number, but I think this idea of curating a set and Evan mentioned this. I think the shelf on the first floor is also a really good place. We've also talked about author talks mm -hmm. that might take place on the first floor of Firestone as a way to give a little bit more um, of a spotlight. So it's not just written text, it's... It, it could be a be conversation with an all author. All kinds of spoken word art. I think so. Anybody else? Maybe I'll just add that um, Follett was talking about the work she was doing with oral histories yesterday and said something about how, oh, that's not archival work. And I really wanted to be like in the moment that is archival work. That's the most important archival work. Um, and I think the, you know, written texts are so limiting in, in one way. And you can see it in all of the collections that we're talking about. Um, they really do just because of the nature of uh, the book as a a technology that we primarily think of, even though printing is more diverse as a technology, as a predominantly white technology in particular. I think the work that Colette is doing is incredibly archival and incredibly important. So I think you can say that. I think you should tell my chief librarian that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was wondering if um, the university has any portable recordings, because I know that was something that was done at one time. And I was wondering, is that in the possession of the library? Thank you. For example, uh, do you remember um, Ives Goddard um, was involved in recording people at Muncie and Moravian Town in 1965 and 1970? And those are held by the Smithsonian. If you know where the, where they, if you already know where they are, 
You might be able to find them on the Smithsonian site. I found them once and then I couldn't find them again. You had to find them in a different place. Not easily discoverable. That 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 is that one of the kinds of things you're thinking of? Yeah. I think the discoverability has been one of the hardest aspects of this work. We have a large number of oral history recordings at the Mud Library, which is part of Special Collections, and they are all available online. But you have to kind of know how to look and, and know what you're looking look. for. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, if you, I don't know if, we, if you had additional thoughts. I, yeah, I know of one collection just offhand. There might be others in Special Collections, um, in particular. It's the Alfonso Ortiz papers, I believe, um, and those have uh, recordings, though they are not currently digitized. Um, they're still on the physical media of, um, I forget what communities, because I don't know the collection that well off the top of my head, but off the top of my head, I think it's New Mexico or somewhere in the Southwest. Um, and yeah, that's really kind of all I know off the top of my head, but there might be others as as well. Rick, as well, did you know? Oh, were you going to speak to that? I don't know if Ricky was going to say anything. Will or Ms. Um, just, just quickly, I mean, we do we, we do have an active oral history program mm -hmm. where we record mm -hmm. where we record this. I don't know whether we was yeah. spending that. Mm -hmm. So on this document is actually the links to the oral history programs. Um, how to make them, how to um, contribute. So there's quite a lot of links on here. Um, the, I think the Ortiz papers are also in the LibGuide. So this is our main LibGuide for Indigenous Studies. And in the Special Collections tab are the, actually it's the very first one, mm -hmm. is Native American Oral Literature. Mm -hmm. I think this is the, the one you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so it raises questions around who owns those recordings, who has access. There are a lot of challenging questions that need to be thought through, but it could be a wonderful resource for developing, archiving, making sustainable and findable materials. That so uh, if I may comment, uh, so I've been involved in an oral history project in Monmouth County about enslaved folks from our geography. And here's what I believe. You're all historians. All you have to do trying to make it as uh, simple as possible. The stories that your individual families have that are important, you can record them as easily accessible technology. And then someone else can figure out how to accumulate them because you, you own these stories and they'll be lost if our elders, your elders and mine pass. So it doesn't have to be a major project uh, initially. Yeah, again, and this is a much larger topic of conversation, maybe something we can keep working on. But families may not necessarily want all their family stories uh, 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 in the library's data management system, right? Um, there has got to be ways to do that that's respect, respectful and keeps private what should be private and provides access in ways that are good, right? Um, so thanks for saying that. Um, maybe have another minute. Is there any final questions? And we'll keep talking. Ian. I just want to highlight something because, you know, the work that Mark was doing um, with Princeton, I, I was aware of, but not the full extent. And I think it really does highlight the, you know, the connection between post-secondary institution and a community to really develop that, that reciprocity. But, you know, if there's something going on, having that ability to come to community and share, hey, this is what we found out uh, on uh, behalf of a community member, and we would like the opportunity to potentially share that. And, uh, you know, in Ontario, that gap tends to, you know, be wide, right, where but we don't really want to come out because we don't want to tread on your toes and you don't have that relationship. And I think that's that's a key piece that really needs to be strengthened in terms of you know the wonderful, wonderful information that the community can use in terms of, hey, these are these are people in my family, right? Now, how do I we make it available to the whole community uh, with some exp explanation as to what, what you provided to me in terms of the background and to what was asked for and, and, and uh, the procedure in which you went and found it. Because of course, the Library and Archives Canada, I got the 1850 census, which isn't very helpful. You're able to get the 1820 through Mark, right? And mm -hmm. that's a piece that, you know, for an amateur historian like myself, is, is not easy. Mm -hmm. But that's very really informative for a community and for people who would love to, to know more about it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I hope we can start that process because, you know, I, I was so, um, I was trained as an archivist at then at uh, an institution next to the National Archives. So I was trained by archivists that worked in big record groups like that. Mm -hmm. And I was just so kind of, I don't know, dispirited by, <laughs> by that process. And, um, and I, I hope what, what this is, you know, I wanted to help Mark, but I also want to help everyone in this room. So, you know, if, if it is helpful in any way, if there's anything else we can be doing that's helpful, I hope this is an opportunity where folks feel like they can come. I just, um, <clears throat> because I've read a lot of our history, mm -hmm. I would like how our connections are because our history is, is north mm -hmm. to Lake Champlain and on the Mahi Kanita. But we know where Muncie too, plus we know the brother town group came from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And so we need more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, else. Just really quickly to, to Ian's point again and what you were saying, Caitlin, I think, I mean, I feel like that theme has come up a lot the past two days about um, access, resources and access. And I think in terms of the conversations of what institutions like um, IAS and Princeton can do is, you know, again, we have these resources and these platforms. Um, and I think, you know, having conversations and prioritizing community needs to share these platforms and use them in a way that it provides, you know, more widely accessible access um, to this data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else to add? I think um, yeah, please. there's also, yeah, to go at it in many directions, but there is a lot that can be done in the library and information science world of, of trying to get more uh, authority file names that are of indigenous people. And to, you have to build, I mean, one way is to build within the existing infrastructure so that things are discoverable, you know? So like even the Library and Archives of Canada or this collection or any of them, it doesn't matter that the stuff is there if you can't find it. And so how is it described and how is it presented in a way that's accessible? That's that's one one whole branch of it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, well, I wonder if we, are you going to be willing to walk people over to the, so this is Bill Noel, who's the Associate University Librarian for Special Collections, where we'll be going next. And I would suggest maybe, I don't know if Chief Thomas and you would like to take half the group address at the bottom when you type it into your computer then 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 you can see it online. Okay. So Pedro, would you Pedro would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, just a, a few words. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, we don't have much time so I think I'd really like to turn you loose. We'd like to talk about active learning in this space. So do feel free to um, turn pages to engage with these texts. The only thing that is slightly fragile in the room is the um, Buxdorf lexicon on the back table and the otter skin binding. Uh, Brianna Kriegel, my colleague, is in the room. She can help you with opening that book. Um, it is in a fragile state. Everything else is kind of hands-on, and we welcome that. A brief introduction of the tables, just so you can get a, a lay of the material that's out. These are, um, this side of the room documents kind of the colonialization of the East Coast, and so we're starting with New Holland, um, uh, which we brought this map because it has, uh, it is it's full of Indigenous place names, and it's a fascinating document in and of itself. And then we, we go from New Holland over to uh, New Sweden, and the Swedish colony, um, one of the missionaries printed a text, which is now the earliest extant uh, Delaware Muncie language text in print. Um, and we have three copies of that um, on the table. And then you heard from my colleague, uh, Faith, <laughs> about the land deed and the work that was done with the Sandhill community. That's on the next table. The uh, 
transcription is on the table as well. That work has led to the discovery of four more um, beads in our collection and the James Alexander papers. And we have started to transcribe that material, um, really doing a first pass with AI, artificial intelligence. And so there is a print out there that did pretty well of an artificial intelligence scan of the first um, bead. Then we get to the Hebrew lexicon. This was owned by a gentleman named um, David Brainerd, a known missionary in these parts. But, um, he died at an early age of tuberculosis at the age of 29 in Jonathan yes. Edwards' house. Jonathan Edwards became uh, president of Princeton University, and that's why the book is here. Uh, there has been a lot of interest in the binding, which is an otter skin and definitely indigenous, and questions on where exactly and who exactly put that binding on the book. The next table over is uh, the lesser Brainerd, I call it. Uh, that's John Brainerd, David Brainerd's brother, who also was a missionary in this area. And this is a diary, again, that is interesting for the indigenous mm -hmm. place names and the, the factual documentation that he's doing in 1860s, uh, 1760s, um, and with the treaty in Pennsylvania in Lancaster. And then we get into some kind of missionary language texts, uh, beginning with Christian translation, and then more spelling and language. Um, there are this room knows more about this material than any other gathering that has <laughs> been on this um, So feel free to instruct each other. Feel free to ask anybody here questions, point out what is interesting. And, um, yeah, I tried to use that. Yeah, for those zooming to the Zoom folks. It must not be in our collection. It is. Oh, I'm glad. Did you get to take pictures already? And this is your first visit to the special class? I'm zooming for the live the Zoom audience. Oh, These are all digitized now. Yeah. So you can just look at them online from anywhere. So she said, you know, see the mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all digitized. Yeah, I want to see it. 
well, it was it was the, it, the impetus from last year, you know. Mm. So that's the kind of thing. Like yeah, no. What's what's a how does it become priority? I'm just zooming to the live for the live people, but yeah. Are they here? Yeah. Yeah. Then I'll stop. It's okay. This URL will take you to the digitized object so you can read yes. the entire I'm just zooming for okay. the live audience. But Sorry. So yes, tell us about the URLs. Okay. Who are you? I'm Brianna Craigle. I'm a member of Public Services and Special Collections. Okay. So any of the URLs at Princeton University Library Special yes. Collections. Okay. Any of the URLs we have on, on all the labels take you directly to catalog records or the finding aid records and you'll be able to see the digital objects usually at the box. And this is the URL. That's what she's talking about. This one. And, um, please look at anything you like, browse anything you like. So they did a DNA analysis of this, and they, it came up as possibly beaver instead of otter. Uh -oh. This is recently, or not? Yeah, it is one that is much more This is the delicate one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they really found a lot of pages in there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a printed book, <laughs> and then they, it's covered with leather, and it's got an actual binding on it, a European binding, but then they, this is like a over cover, you know, it's like a wrapper. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I used to wrap my school books up in brown paper bags. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like that. It's like a protected <laughs> cover, but then it also comes from. Maybe a Lenape piece of clothing, you know? I don't know, Thelma, I was talking, looking at Thelma. She said, oh, maybe if you look at it this way, it's like mountains, you know, the under and upper realms. Yeah, I mean, you see a lot of people clothing, a lot of black heads and red. Yeah, that's what she was saying. And a lot of like, like positive and negative space. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny, it looks like Julie's exhibit. You know, Julie had the exhibit with the three big red frames. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know that, but even this one, you see it with the um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is this a great map? Yeah, I've got it, but I, I want to get a better copy. Oh. Do you have a reproduction of it or, or an uh, Yeah, I've got a whole series of maps that I grabbed online. For all I know, I got it from here, but I'm thinking I can get a much better image here. Without my shadow in it. Yes. Okay, so what's, what's under our uh, lives? So you have um, just trying to get a shadow. <laughs> It's another bird. It's another bird. But this bird is just crawling still with it. So what kind of crawling? What kind of crawling? 
Yeah, I'm gonna call that time to get this up on Yep. You know we're not doing this. Not speaking of this. Send it to my suit. Yeah. 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 Oh, this is one. So the three copies are the same. And then this one is. This is the no, no, no. Since this is different. This is a little kind of. Yes, uh, translated into a rocket in the United States. Yeah. I don't think this one's better. I don't think these are full. Yeah. No, in the fall. Yeah. 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 And the script does not help. Yeah. It says up here in Latin, New Sweden, today called Pennsylvania. This is it says. Uh, oh, this one. Oh, snow. Yes, come on. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what he discriminates half an hour playing just getting right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> This is the Tinton Falls document that we saw in the presentation by Claire Garland. But everything is digitized, so you just have to find the URL for or type in Tinton Falls at the Princeton University Library website. This is the Tinton Falls document that oh, they have. Yeah. The That's in our, um, our tree project. Yeah. But I have never seen the original, so that's kind of cool. And if you take a picture, we'll try to get this for you somewhere, but because this has a really high intensity digital really available to download. Next time. You need a kid to do a QR. I know exactly. I don't know how to do it. Um, the kid, the kid did this, and you he just typed in the um, URL yeah, into uh, a, it's a actually website. really easy. QR code maker. Yeah, you just Google QR code maker and type in the URL, and then it caught the link. The image pops up and you can do copy, boom, so boom, boom. That's what Corel says, and it's true. It's very true. I've done it myself. I've done it too. I mean, even a kid can do it or a semi literate adult. I was doing some of my um, the URL link. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, you got to test them. Yeah. You got to test them. Yeah. On all devices, like computers and different But I, and then after I tested those, I don't know how to fix that. Like, you have to just do a, use a different QR code maker, I think. Uh, you and do a new one. Yeah. I was wondering if it was the website. Could be. Well, yeah, I don't know. See, that's that's way beyond my skill set. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's beyond my skill set. I just said something. Oh, is this recording? Okay. Zooming basically to the to the live audience. The other floor. I didn't think the map was there. Could you share those? And the, these are copies of documents that I'm working on, Suzanne and I are working on now that are in the New Jersey State Archives. So like the notary would make different copies and it's, it says that in the document that we made this. So they, they, they have a meeting where the land transaction happens and then they have a, they make a document about them. They have another meeting where it's authorized and that can only happen with like a court or something. So it only happens at a certain time. So these probably traveling courts, I don't know if I'm picking up. This scribe very clearly, like just saying, having looked and, at a lot of older documents, this is actually like a <laughs> Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah. And then they have a another copy when it's approved. So there were like three, and so these are copies of the ones I was transcribing from the New Jersey State Archives. And, but we didn't know they were here until we started talking to the librarians. And so it's pretty cool. I look forward to digging through this and try to figure out which one covers the Cox land and all of the history bonds. Oh, well, we should just give you the transcriptions. This, right? Did they transcribe them? Gosh, they, they did all the work I should. Awesome. Yeah. This, I wonder if that's on the, here. Let's take a picture I hope, of that. I hope so. Given to me. Fourth Street Church by Reverend Mr. Sanders. That there, I know that's that's what I'm thinking about. My phone is dying, so I'm going to sign off, and Suzanne can say goodbye also. To the Zoom audience, Thank thanks so for much for joining. <laughs>
I, I myself arrived here in 1997 from England and I actually spent 14 years working in a museum uh, before I, before I um, moved to big research, research libraries. And I think the museums have a, have, a, have, a, have, a, have a, a way of being welcoming that libraries can learn from. And I have a theory as to why that's so. Um, it, is that, it is that museums don't have a guaranteed audience. People need books, so they come here to use books. But people go to museums because, they're, because they, they want to have a nice experience. And so museums are really, really good at welcoming people. And I think that we've got a lot to learn yet about welcoming people, um, but that we've got you here today is a great triumph of yours and a small one of ours. And so thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I remember very well last year um, at the first symposium here, where I was with Ian and with Suzanne and with Chief Mark Peters, uh, looking at some of our materials, and it was a wonderful and moving moment, and uh, it helped move the needle for us. And since then, um, we have digitized all of our indigenous language materials before the 20th century. That's about 100 items. Mm -hmm. um, and we have also worked uh, with you in improving descriptions of our materials. Um, and I think that Claire and Rick have been very helpful uh, to the archivists in helping them. And, uh, you know, I am so very conscious of uh, the need for uh, community and interaction between us. And I think that, you know, digitizing, digitizing our materials, or should I say your materials, because they, they are your materials. And when it comes to the um, digitization of them, you should be aware that, that, that you, you can do as much with this material as we can. That is to say, you can download this material, you can share it with your friends, you can put it on your own social media, you can take it and use it and own it. Um, and that is something that we're really uh, proud of here, which is which is making this stuff truly available to you. Um, I do think that digitization is just the start. I think that um, having making sure that it's that it's produced in ways that that, that are easy for you to reach without having to come and talk to us um, and easy for you to share is really important. And we can learn from you how best to do that. So. Thank you so much for coming. I hope that you've enjoyed seeing the items that we brought out for you today. It's been a real honor and a privilege to be part of the day. And I want to thank Anu from the library and Suzanne from the IAS and so many other people uh, for making, making this possible. And so on behalf of Anne Jarvis, thank you very much for a wonderful day. The first thought that goes through my mind is uh, it, it was it has to be on the in New Jersey for as many um, people involved with the Muncie language to get together, which seems kind of odd because most of us live north of the border. Um, but it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to to have the discussion with those uh, who are well experienced with the language, who've been teachers for a long time, who've researched the language, to be able to have that space in order to have a have a chat without the, you know, um, the need to, to have to get back to your job right away or knowing that you're, you know, you're needed in your classroom in a couple of minutes, you can have a, a better conversation than uh, on my part, I haven't been able to have for many years, um, simply because of a geographical distance as to where I live, but also you have to set those things up in advance. And I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity uh, within uh, this this place to have that conversation to come back to uh, the place where Muncie people are from to have a conversation about language. The other part that I, I find really uh, interesting in the work that I do that's very prevalent uh, throughout the, the two days and, and through the partnerships with uh, with Princeton and IAS and and those that have been very helpful is the notion of reciprocity 
but also that piece where Muncie language, culture, and history cannot be divided. And I strongly believe that our people, as they left uh, New Jersey and had to go to Ontario or to Wisconsin or far out to Oklahoma, the language is hidden, but it's there for us to find it. The history is there to find and the culture is there to find. So, I mean, you know, looking at the language and listening to Christian yesterday, breaking down a word, right? There are the clues. Our people, our ancestors left those clues for us to find. They left our songs with uh, the Oneida, right? They gave pieces when they knew that they were in trouble to other groups so that we could come back and find them when we were at that time. And uh, no better witness to that over the last couple of days where um, we have allies that are willing to help in terms of, oh, we have this material that would be very helpful in terms of your work, right? Or there's a dictionary from the 1800s that's helpful for understanding the Muncie language or finding those missing words. And, uh, and I come back also to the overflowing conversation is all about land base, right? We learn from the arts world, right? The arts, the people involved with the arts can tell us things, right? Uh, simply just going out into nature. How many Osage oranges just showed up the second day after I got one? Yeah. People are, what the heck? <laughs> but, I, you know, I think that that's the power, right? Where, you know, you take something you don't know or you just, you, you pass off, right? I don't know what it is. And then you bring it in, you go, well, okay, so is there more to this than what I, I don't know, right? And that's, um, I think it's really important for Indigenous youth to have that, that reconnection to land, to understand what's around us, uh, maybe to, to, you know, put this down just once in a while, but unless you're looking up the natural dictionary. Or you're looking up the dictionary. <laughs> but it's, it's so important to, to acknowledge what's around us, uh, to get back into that space of, of knowing, and I think that we're taking those steps, right? Each time uh, we come together, uh, new things are found and new things are shared. And that's the key, you gotta share what's going on in each community. If I'm finding out things that are going on in other people's communities, I'm going, oh, in a teacher's college, they teach you, it's beg, borrow, and steal, right? <laughs> so if you go into another person's classroom, you're going through their file, oh, sorry, I'm dating myself. You're going through their filing cabinet. <laughs> but it, <laughs> I know it's yeah, getting you get so many good ideas in, in order of, of where you want to go next with your own research your own language work or or cultural work you can share back home and I think that's uh, the amazing piece of, of the, the first uh, symposium last year uh, and then this symposium face to face and being able to chat with people in the same space instead of virtual is so very important. And uh, just on behalf of myself, I just want to say Watanishik for all those wonderful conversations I've been able to have and people I've not seen or met only through text message or through Facebook Messenger. And then Anishik for the organizers, right? I much appreciate it. Anishik. Cole Mosi, Nishinzi Kikai Roger Thomas. First time I got to do that all this week. <laughs> it was Karen that said, you should introduce yourself in your language. Yeah. This is hard. <laughs> But um, I, I wish Karen and Mark were here. Mm -hmm. They'd be very proud of this. Mm -hmm. This whole symposium that went on, the way it was put together, you know, everyone talked about it. And I'm very proud of the uh, speakers that do push the language forward in their communities. Very proud. I, I get jealous when I see my niece and nephew. They start at in kindergarten mm -hmm. or prior to that, and they speak their language very fluently, the Cremonida, and I, like I said, I'm jealous. I'm jealous because that never was offered to myself or any of my boys. You know, it was just maybe 
one class in high school, one class in public school, something like that, you know, and if, if it's not there, you don't grasp it. So I'm, I'm very proud of that, that you guys are making that move. Every nation is pushing that language forward. Um, Mark would have been, been very proud to see uh, how far you guys have gone on this and uh, the history. I mean, Mark, Mark lived for history. Mm -hmm. Karen lived for language. Her and her mother taught it before it was even available on uh, the internet and so on and so forth. And no, um, my nation thanks you for hosting this, um, my membership, and um, hopefully we, we can do this again and I can bring more members here. You know, they, they're the ones who need to see this and know what's going on and, uh, you know, get some revitalization of where their land used to be. Um, I, I, I just want to share a little story. Last time I went with Mark, we came to Philadelphia to for a reburial, and it was at the uh, Penn Estate. And all the way here, all the way back, you know, it was it was a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and every every name that was a Muncie name or anything like that, Mark would name it and, you know, and he'd give us a little lesson on that. It was myself and Councilor Ross Albert who were in the vehicle with him. And um, it, it, it was a, it was a great ride. It was enjoyable. And, you know, it, it's now it's, it's one of probably my most memorable rides, mm -hmm. but um no, like I said, those those two will be missed. We lost uh, two very good people in a short time that did a lot of work for our community. Um, so um, I'd like I'll say thank you for being here for them because to me that's uh, it, it's an honoring is what it is. I believe in in my mind that this still stay together and people still talk about Karen and Mark the way they should be talked about. So I appreciate that. I appreciate Princeton holding this. Suzanne, you're a great host. Yes. Um, yeah, so Anishik, Anishik, Anishik. Anishik. With the words, um, good way to end. Bring the young folks next time. You know, one of the I'll bring, I'll bring all the ones that you should meet and I'll leave them with you. That Mark was talking about last year, we talked about the spring too, is what we could do. And we're talking to Caitlin Peters about this too, to make it in. How can I put it? Young people are not always interested in listening to the old folks talk about history all day. I don't know why not. Um, but, um, but what are the kinds of things they might like to do? So maybe organizing time on the land, time in Manhattan, thing, things that um, uh, they can connect to immediately. And then the other stuff can come at the end as their interest is awakened and where their passion is becomes more and more visible. So I would really like to think about good ways to do that. Well, did you want to say anything about the exhibit? Yeah, please. That would be a good way to end. Um, yes, you know, uh, thank you, Anne. <laughs> From the bottom of my heart. I will say, I will say this, that, that, uh, one of the, one of the preconceptions that, that librarians struggle with is that people think that of libraries as where, as where the books are. And and libraries are about an awful lot more than books. Um, and one of the things that we're really proud of um, at Princeton University Library um, is collecting ephemera, often as it is made. Uh, posters and placards of protest, for example. Um, and uh, so in the exhibition upstairs, and the other thing, oh yeah, the other thing that I like to think of as libraries as uh, are 
a library is not just a place that stores and reserves. A library is a place that makes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we are extremely good, I think, at making digital information. And uh, I like to think of digital information not as a copy of a hard, a real artifact, uh, but as an original in its own right that can do all sorts of things that a material thing can't do. Um, so upstairs, uh, there isn't a, sing a single original artifact. They are uh, reproductions from our, from our digital library. And when you normally see a digital library, uh, you can see it on your computer screen, and it's and it, and it, and it's good as a reference image. It's good for research. Um, but there are just there are there are four little exhibits in one upstairs, and I just want to talk about just two of them. Although I can talk about four for a long time if you want me to. Um, one of the one of the uh, things that we do here is we have a public policy papers of people who have helped form policy in the government. And one of these people is a man called John Dore, who was deeply involved mm. in um, desegregation policy in the South. Um, and he was uh, there for the freedom marches and for the March on Selma. Uh, and we have photographs of uh, the March on the March from Selma to Montgomery. And uh, from the first day, and when you look at these re things that we've reproduced on the computer, they're fine, that you've, that there's information there, but they're not emotive. Um, when you go upstairs in the gallery, we've, re we've reproduced them at life size. Literally, we know, we know the size of John Lewis. Mm -hmm. And John Lewis is reproduced at, at life size. Um, and you go into the gallery and you can march with John Lewis. And I've got photos of people marching with John Lewis and it's very moving. It's also rather powerful and it's deeply scary. And it puts you into that, it puts you into that place in a way that, in a way that the original photograph, you can see that it's a real record, but it won't put you in that same place in the same way. So I hope that you notice that. Another one is that, um, the, even today, there are women's marches in Pakistan. Uh, they're called the Arab marches. And um, the posters for those marches, uh, are, they're made digitally, and they're disseminated digitally, and they're reproduced, and they're put on walls in Pakistan, and the authorities tear them down immediately. Um, we have and we save those digital files and we've reproduced them and we've stuck them on the walls here. And it really feels like doing it again. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm really proud of that. But we also have, and you will see, um, uh, a section on um, social protest in Chile. Uh, which is also going on even to this day. Mm -hmm. And we also have a section on uh, activism in Jewish activism in relation to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And the, the story of the Holocaust is, is often so much one of victimization. Um, but actually, this is a story of reaction and protest uh, in the wake of the Holocaust using the Haggadot um, and... Uh, and, and I think it's very powerful. So uh, we're very proud of it. So thank you for that, Anu. And let's and let's make our way up there, shall we? Right. Great. Thanks so much.